if more people join, then so be it. Alexandra is going to help us accept everyone. Anatole, just please ignore all of those appearing mm -hmm. uh, messages and uh, um, invites. I will deal with that. All right. So um, good evening, everyone. It's already uh, 5 p.m. in Moscow. Still good afternoon, Anatole. Um, our department today, which is the Department of International Relations and International Laboratory on World Order Studies and the New Regionalism of the National Research University Higher School of Economics, is holding the 29th session of our Eurasian online seminar. Our guest today is a British author, Orwell, winning, Orwell Prize winning journalist um, and policy analyst, Anatole Levin. Um, the topic of his talk is an Afghan tragedy and the roots of Taliban success. Um, Anatole Levin is senior research fellow on Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft who is formerly a professor at Georgetown University in Qatar and in the War Studies Department of King's College London. He's a member of the academic board of the Valdai Discussion Club in Russia and a member of the advisory committee of the South Asia Department of the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. He holds a bachelor's degree and a PhD from Cambridge University in England. From 1985 to 1998, Anatole even worked as a British journalist in South Asia, the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and covered the wars in Afghanistan, Chechnya and the Southern Caucasus. As a journalist, he reported from both sides of the Afghan war in the 1980s um, and have visited the country frequently since the fall of the Taliban in 2001. Um, from 2000 to 2007, he worked at think tanks in Washington, DC. Dr. Levin is author of several books on Russia and its neighboring um, countries, including the Baltic Revolutions, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and the path to independence, and Ukraine and Russia, a fraternal rivalry. His book, Pakistan, a Heart Country, is on the official reading list for US and British diplomats serving in that country. His latest book, Climate Change and the Nation State, was published in March, 2020. Um, a lot of you, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the format of the seminar. The talk will take approximately 45 minutes or so. Um, Q&A session um, is going to happen afterwards. If you do have any of the questions, please write down your um, name and or um, your question in the chat and I'll call you out or I'll read out your question, however you prefer to do it. Um, and that'll be at the end of the session. Um, now, dear Anatole, we're truly delighted to have you here today. Thank you very much uh, for agreeing to speak. Um, with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Olga. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> I'm afraid, as your introduction brings out, you know, having been a, a journalist before, I always told my students that I, I can teach everything except marriage and car maintenance. Um, so uh, in the discussion, you know, I can also talk about other subjects if people are interested. But today we will talk about Afghanistan. Uh, now, I first went into Afghanistan in 1987, my God, 34 years ago, uh, with the Afghan Mujahideen, the Dushmani, as they then were. And um, the, um, this lecture and the essay on which it's based uh, really come originally out of my reading at that time, because much to the bemusement of other Western journalists who I was traveling with, I, I took with me a very large book on the whole... You, shouldn't take large books with you into Afghanistan because you have to carry them on your back everywhere. Uh, but what I took with me was the Mukaddima, the introduction to history of Ibn Khaldun, the 14th century Arab, great Arab sociologist and historian. And I must say it was a funny experience reading him by flashlight at night, you know, while everybody else was uh, asleep. Because, although naturally, much has changed since his day. It was pretty striking in Afghanistan just how much of the things he was talking about still seemed applicable uh, to uh, Afghan rural and particularly Pashtun society uh, in the 1980s, but also with certain variations, which I will discuss up to the present. And sorry, take a. As you may know, Ibn Khaldun is chiefly famous for his view of the cyclical nature of history. He, of course, said this was universal history, but he was really talking about the Maghreb, North Africa of his time. Uh, but you can apply that 
uh, to tribal societies really all over the Muslim world. And his theory was that basically armed strength, but armed strength founded on social solidarity, tribal solidarity, came out of the desert. And uh, in the Muslim world was very often combined with puritanical reformism, you know, with a, 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 a preacher calling for the restoration uh, of a purer form of Islam. This tribal revolt or tribal jihad then overthrew um, the decadent, luxurious and oppressive dynasty ruling the, uh, the neighboring cities and plains and replaced it with a new dynasty, new set of rulers from the tribes who started out um, you know, on the basis of their tribal tradition with a solid, you know, a solid tribal base, austere in their habits, you know, religious in their, in, in their allegiance and behavior. Uh, but uh, over the course of the succeeding generations, they too became corrupted by city life and city government and were eventually overthrown by a new revolt from the tribes. And uh, Ibn <coughs> Khaldun's um, version uh, of the medieval Islamic society of the Maghreb was founded on a clear division between what, I mean, less so now because the state has really, of course, extended its power. Uh, but really, I mean, in Morocco uh, until the, um, the, the middle of the last century, a distinction between the Beled Ismachtsen, the land of government, which basically meant the cities and the agriculture, the plains, the agricultural areas, and the Beled is Siba, which can be translated uh, in different ways as the land of freedom, the land of revolt, the land of dissent, or perhaps best of all, the land of anarchy. Now, uh, when I read this in Ibn Khaldun, I was immediately, of course, uh, reminded of Afghanistan and uh, the, especially the Pashtun areas uh, of uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, because they have their own version of the Bledis Siba. They call it Yagistan, which translates almost the same, you know, the land of freedom, dissent, anarchy, lack of rule. And uh, the distinction between them is summed up in one of the grimmest proverbs about human society and political life that I have ever read, a, a deeply, deeply tragic version, which Khaldun would have agreed with, but which really, I mean, you know, sums up uh, Afghan uh, and to some extent Pakistani history to this day. And it goes feuding, feuds, feud, you know, tribal wars devoured the mountains and taxes devoured the plains. In other words, you have a choice between living under an oppressive government, you know, in the valleys and the plains, which taxes you, which conscripts you into the army, which oppresses you in many ways, or you have the option of freedom in the mountains. Uh, but of course, with freedom comes anarchy, constant violence, constant feuds between families and clans. And of course, in modern times, this didn't so much apply earlier, uh, the lack of you know, even the most miserable and inadequate state services of education and uh, health services. By the way, I mean, it's worth noting that while, of course, in, in Ibn Khaldun's day, there was no such thing as, as medical services anywhere, uh, he was also very much aware of the extent to which the tribes and the plains and the cities depended on each other. Uh, the tribes, of course, depended on the cities for manufactured goods, above all weapons, make, didn't make their own weapons, um, and uh, for education, for religious education, because the tribes, of course, are illiterate, deeply Muslim, uh, but without an, uh, an ability to actually read the, the, the core text. So they depended on education and manufacturers coming from the towns. And the towns depended on the tribes, of course, for supplies of livestock, of meat, sheep, wool, uh, but also for the provision of mercenary soldiers. Uh, because core to 
Ibn Khaldun's uh, vision uh, of this cyclical nature of history uh, was the idea that, uh, to put it bluntly, civilized people don't make good soldiers. You know, farmers, urban people can't fight. The tribes, the tribes of the mountains can fight, uh, of the mountains and the, uh, the deserts, uh, because they basically have to train the whole time for tribal war. That makes them better fighters. And also, they're simply tougher. Now, uh, the enduring importance of this, I mean, but by the way, you may think that a, a good deal of this is, um, uh, you know, is, is a rather cliched version. But then the whole point about cliches, of course, why do they become cliches? Well, because they have considerable elements of truth in them. And I, um, when I was te teaching at Georgetown University in Qatar, I, I used to amuse myself at the expense of um, my students and some of my progressive colleagues uh, who had really fallen, you know, for this Orientalist line that, you know, any, any attempt to, to, to portray, you know, different, different cultures, especially Muslim cultures, as different, you know, as with, you know, their own strong and enduring traditions over time, this constituted Western Orientalism and was basically a form of, at best, Western imperialism, at worst, racism, uh, coming from um, Edward Said. So, um, I, I'm sorry to say this also does rather reflect the ignorance of a good many of my students and um, and their teachers, uh, possibly, um, well, well, no, that's a different story. Uh, but, um, so I would read them passages of Ibn Khaldun and ask them what they thought of it, but without telling them who'd written it. And many of them would say, oh, this is a dreadful Orient Western Orientalist portrait of Muslim society. And I'd garner a few of these opinions, and then I'd, I'd say, um, no, uh, sorry, it was written by a, a famous, you know, Arab Muslim scholar. And then some of them would say, ah, oh, yes, but obviously th this was a, an Arab Muslim scholar, uh, you know, who, who was living under European colonialism and was, you know, simply parroting Western views. And I said, oh, no, he wasn't. He was living 700 years ago or so, you know, under purely Muslim governments. That shut him up. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, I, I think that much of the analysis of Ibn Khaldun uh, does still um, hold uh, good uh, for this day. And uh, I must say, uh, you know, his, um, his idea of the decadence of the cities and the, um, uh, the, you know, the toughness of the tribes and the mountains was brought home to me by a, a conversation I actually had with a, an Iranian uh, professor and former member of parliament at the Valdai conference, which I attended in Sochi last month, because I was asking um, uh, this Iranian whether uh, Iran had been surprised by the speed of the Taliban victory in Afghanistan. And he said, yes, we were, because, you know, remembering how these local warlords uh, had put up a, you know, a, a pretty long and tough fight against the Taliban in the 1990s, Tajik warlords, Uzbek warlords, some Pashtuns, um, we had expected uh, them not to win in the end, but to put up <laughs> a sufficient fight uh, that we would then be able to basically mediate between them and the Taliban and extract from the Taliban concessions about local autonomy, especially for you know, our local allies, the Hazara, the Shia in, uh, in Afghanistan. And then he said something very interesting. He said, what we didn't understand is that back in the 90s, the people who we were backing had fought, you, you know, for more than 15 years of terrible war, you know, first against the Soviets and the communists, you know, then against their Mujahideen rivals in Afghanistan. And they were tough, but they were also, I mean, um, uh, he, he didn't use the word, but what he was really talking about in a way um, was uh, Ibn Khaldun's phrase, asabir, solidarity. They were close to the men they led. 
And he said, what we didn't realize is that these people have now spent 20 years living in villas and palaces in Kabul or Mazar or Herat, uh, you know, getting fat and rich and decadent and lazy off stolen Western aid and heroin money. And they're just not the men they were 20 years ago. And they're men. Their followers are not the men they were. That was very much brought home to me by a famous um, uh, film that some of you may have seen. Uh, when the, the, um, the Taliban occupied the palace in Mazari Sharif of General Dostum, the Uzbek warlord and former vice president uh, under Ashraf Ghani. And you had this picture of these very tough looking, heavily bearded Mujahideen fi uh, Taliban fighters with their, their guns uh, in their traditional dress, very dirty it was too, sitting on these gilded chairs in Dostum's palace, on these beautiful carpets, looking at themselves in these enormous gilded mirrors. And I mean, that is Khaldun to the life. It is the mountains coming to town and overthrowing a decadent, you know, essentially rotten dynasty. Uh, of course, he would say now that the um, the Taliban will become decadent and rotten in their in their turn, uh, but um, he said this would take uh, two or three generations. We'll have to see. Uh, so, core to the history of modern Afghanistan has been uh, what James Scott, the famous anarchist historian, called the art of not being governed. Uh, the resistance of the tribes of the mountains and deserts to state government. Now, above all, of course, alien non-Muslim government introduced first by the British Empire, then by the Soviet Union or backed by the Soviet Union, then by the Americans, but also very frequently to their own governments, um, to governments uh, in Afghanistan. And that has been a crucial obstacle uh, to the creation of a modern Afghan state ever since people first started trying to create a modern Afghan state back in the 19, uh, back in the, in the 1880s. Uh, and this deep attachment to freedom from state authority, coupled with, of course, devotion to Islam, Islam as understood by the rural Pashtuns has characterized one revolt after another, you know, since the 19th century. Uh, there's a, an excellent book on, on this subject by somebody called Sana Haroun called Frontier of Faith, which tracks this through a number of um, revolts against the British, but also against the Afghan government um, of Emir uh, Abdurrahman in the, um, uh, in the late 19th century. Now, another striking thing uh, in Afghanistan is um, that the classic means by which conservative populations are reconciled to modernizing states in developing countries has been nationalism, where you can get it. Um, it turns out that in Afghanistan, you can't get it, or you can only get it for, you know, in rather indirect and um, uh, veiled ways. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of Afghan and particularly Pashtun nationalism uh, among the, um, the Taliban, uh, but you have to dig pretty carefully and, if you like, translate the, the tropes, the language in which they're expressing this. It certainly is not you know, the classic straightforward, you know, modern version of modern nationalism from Europe or Japan or whatever. Um, and now, why has Afghanistan failed uh, to develop a modern nationalism that can reconcile people to the state? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, partly it is that tribe, kinship and religion take precedence. Um, there is a very real sense in which the Afghan state has never been sovereign. If by sovereignty you mean uh, both um, Max Weber's 
uh, definition of the modern state that it has a monopoly of the legitimate use of armed force. Afghan state has never had that. People in the Afghan countryside have always been heavily armed. Uh, only for about 30 years from the 1940s to the 1970s, thanks to modern tanks and aircraft imported from abroad, was the Afghan state strong enough to defeat united tribal revolts. But equally importantly, local people have insisted on pursuing feuds with each other when necessary, but also in enforcing traditional law when it comes to their own members. No Afghan family that I know of in the countryside has ever asked the state uh, when, alas, it's been a question of killing one of their women folk for immorality or murdering, you know, somebody from a, a neighboring tribe for uh, running off with one of their women. So the state has not been fully sovereign. Uh, but uh, also, there has been um, the fact that the Pashtuns, the people of state, are only a plurality, not a majority of the population in Afghanistan, 40%, 45% at most. And ever since first the Sikhs and then the British conquered the Peshawar Valley in the mid 19th century, most Pashtuns have actually lived in what is now Pakistan, not in Afghanistan. So you have a, a divided people. Now that shouldn't have been a complete obstacle because after all you have the Kurds are also divided um, among different states, but they have a very strong element of, uh, of nationalism. Uh, but there are also two other factors. Uh, the first is um, that uh, the Pashtuns themselves are deeply tribally divided with significantly different cultural traditions between the two main branches of the Pashtun tribes. The Abdali, um, who were then renamed the Durrani, the, the, the pearls, the pearl-like people by the first king of Afghanistan, um, uh, Ahmad Shah Abdali in the, in the mid 18th century, uh, and the Khilzai. Now, the Durrani, uh, possibly because they live next to and have been influenced by the Baluch, have a much more autocratic and aristocratic and hereditary tribal tradition, which then fed into the uh, Afghan monarchy as it existed from the mid 18th century in different forms uh, until the 1970s. Um, so one chieftain or Sardar succeeds his father, not always, but that's the general, um, the general pattern, uh, or at least um, the, uh, the transition of power is kept within a narrow aristocratic elite. Uh, the Ghilzai are very different. Uh, they are democratic with a small d and much more meritocratic. Um, to achieve leadership among the Ghilzai, uh, you have to have, well, achieved something. You have to have made a name, a name it's called in, in Pashtun, norm for yourself in some way or other. And <clears throat> it's very striking that every revolt against the Afghan, every Pashtun revolt against the Afghan state from the 19th century on has been Ghilzai led all the way down to the Taliban, who are not exclusively, but uh, chiefly Hillzai. There is another twist to this, very important in the context of modern nationalism or the lack of it, which is that with their more aristocratic tradition, and then of course, when they formed the monarchy of Afghanistan, uh, like so many other people in, in that part of the world, they derived their court culture and their court and bureaucratic language from the tradition of Iranian or Persian Turkic state tradition of Iran, Central Asia, and indeed uh, Mughal India. And the court and official language of Afghanistan, even under a Pashtun dynasty, was not Pashtu, but a well, it was more or less constructed local dialect of Farsi called Dari. So you had in Afghanistan, even among the Pashtuns, some of the same phenomenon that you had uh, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, which is that the ruling elite of the Ottoman Empire, though Turkish by origin, uh, in fact, um, had become very un-Turkic in ethnicity and culture. And Turks, Anatolian Turks, were, uh, if anything, looked down on as backward peasants you know, and tribal people, compared to the much more cosmopolitan, of course, Muslim, uh, but also multi, uh, in effect, multi-ethnic 
elites of Constantinople, of Istanbul. So um, these were some of the barriers to generating Pashtun nationalism in Afghanistan. But a third barrier is simply poverty. But poverty in this case uh, expressed above all in the inability to create a modern school system. Because of course, the classic, absolutely classic means of spreading nationalism from elites to mass populations in modern history, uh, everywhere that it's proved possible has been the state school system. By the way, that was uh, also true in America in, in the late 19th century. Immigrants were assimilated by a really determined uh, effort to preach Americanism and American nationalism through the schools. Uh, Eugen Weber's famous study of French nationalism, uh, when peasants became Frenchmen, uh, is above all about the way in which the French state school system inculcated Frenchness. Uh, Afghanistan has never been able to do that because the state has never been able to create a modern school system. It's simply been too poor. Uh, and it's the, the poverty of Afghanistan, um, the lack of state revenue, uh, goes back to two things. Uh, obviously that Afghanistan is naturally uh, mostly a very poor country, um, mountainous, desert, lack of water in agricultural terms. But also, in many ways, the European who did the most damage to Afghanistan, historically speaking, um, was not Russian or British or even American, it's Portuguese, Vasco da Gama. The redirection of international trade routes, uh, the famous Silk Road in the 16th century, from the overland routes between India and China to the Middle East and Europe, to the sea routes controlled by a succession of European powers, basically deprived the Afghan state, or, well, there was no Afghan state there, but local rulers of revenue. Uh, because um, rulers in, in tribal societies have always taxed trade, or of course, urban bazaars, uh, for the simple reason that it's not a terribly good idea to ask an armed tri tribesman to pay taxes unless you have an army at your back. And of course, paying for the, an army to collect taxes then swallows most of the taxes that you collect. So it's, as you might say, a bit of a contradiction in terms. Uh, and Ibn Khaldun has, a, ha, has a, a nice line about this in which he says, um, uh, basically no, no, no tribesman with the slightest self-respect ever pays taxes to the state. It's ridiculous to ask them to do so, you know, forget it. And the Afghan state for most of its history has indeed had to forget it. Uh, now, an interesting twist today, of course, um, is the fact that some at least of the tribesmen across the country uh, now um, control an extremely valuable uh, resource, heroin, uh, which commands, of course, an enormous price on international markets. The first thing from Afghanistan that ever has, really, for a very, very long time now. Uh, but of course, uh, heroin, by definition, uh, is a, um, a substance that is extremely difficult to tax, partly because you can't say that you're doing it. Um, the Taliban have taxed it very successfully as part of their war effort. Uh, and a big question now in Afghanistan is uh, whether we can pay the Taliban enough to get them to give up that source of revenue. So um, the, uh, you have these elements of, you know, therefore in Afghanistan, of a very old, very traditional standoff between um, Yagistan, the land of anarchy, and the state. Now, however, when it comes to characterizing the, um, the, the land of anarchy, it's extremely important to note, um, as Ibn Khaldun did, and you know, every respectable observer since, that this is anarchy the absence of government rule. It is not chaos. And traditionally, the Pashtun tribes have exemplified through their, their ethnic code, the Pashtun Valley, the way of the Pashtuns, uh, what the British anthropologist um, writing on African tribes, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, called ordered anarchy. In other words, a system in which you have no state rule, but you have very deep 
traditions which exist to not to end warfare between the tribes, but to limit it, to control it, to prevent it getting out of hand, and also to keep it within certain bounds. Uh, uh, there are two, I think, very good analogies here. One of which was made by a famous uh, British imperial jurist, Sir Henry Maine, uh, in the 19th century, when he compared traditional tribal law, rivage as it's called uh, in, uh, elsewhere in Pakistan, to international law. In other words, neither can be enforced by state authority because there is no overarching state. Uh, they depend on convention, cultural conventions and mutual agreements, uh, much less than on actual, you know, written and enforceable law. Uh, they require very often neutral mediators accepted by both sides rather than formal legal institutions. Um, and they exist to limit violence, not to end it. You know, in state legal codes, whether Chinese, Roman, whatever, the idea in principle is that crime shouldn't exist. Violence shouldn't exist. It's illegal. It should be stopped. No traditional tribal code has ever believed that. No, but it is to prevent limited warfare becoming general warfare. Another parallel that can be made, especially when it comes to the, uh, the occasions on which people can be killed and who it is legitimate to kill and not to kill, uh, could be made with mafia codes. Um, if any of you have watched these classic American series about the mafia, you'll have noticed that there are very strict rules about where and when you can kill people and who you can kill and not kill. And of course, above all, you mustn't kill people's families. Now, the mafia sees that as part of their you know, old morality, their old moral code. But what this also is, of course, is simply a way of maintaining a basic orderly and civilized existence. Uh, continuing violence, but limiting violence so that it doesn't turn into basically wars of mutual extermination. Uh, so you have the, this traditional tribal code. Now, <clears throat> back in um, uh, early 1989, when I was traveling in Afghanistan um, with the Mujahideen, uh, by the way, in, in that summer, I, I actually got a visa to go on the the government side as well after the Soviet troops had done um, had withdrawn. Uh, I had a fascinating conversation um, in the province of Pakhtia with a local Qazi, an Islamic judge, who was with one of the Mujahideen groups. And something that had really struck me going into the Mujahideen areas, you know, as somebody who'd been brought up on, you know, reading about the Viet Cong, the FLN in Algeria, you know, watching things like um, the Battle of Algiers, if any of you have seen it, where you know, the FLN really determinedly tries to set up parallel structures of government authority, was that there was none of this in the Mujahideen areas. Um, the entire state had vanished altogether, and there had been no attempt by local people to put it back together again. Um, there were no state services of any kind whatsoever in, in these areas. Uh, and of course, uh, these areas were also divided between multiple different Mujahideen groups. So uh, I was talking to this Kazi and I asked him, Kazi Saab, uh, aren't you afraid that, now here's an interesting phrase which the Mujahideen used, not um, you know, when the communists are overthrown or when we win, but when the cities fall, when the cities fall, when the mountains and the deserts overthrow and occupy the cities. And of course, loot them, plunder them. But aren't you afraid that when the cities fall, there will be chaos in Afghanistan? Look, you've got half a dozen Mujahideen groups just in this valley. And he said, um, no, I don't think so, because, uh, you know, we have the Pashtun Valley, our, our code, which exists precisely to, to limit and control this kind of violence. And then I said to him, yes, sir, but... Um, uh, th this was a code for a completely tribal society, you know, traditional society. But now you have all these political parties, you have all this money coming in from outside, from America, from Saudi Arabia, from Pakistan. Um, uh, and of course, you have heroin money, which has created, you know, new warlords who are, 
not simply uh, the traditional tribal leaders. And then he said something really interesting and absolutely prophetic of you know, what happened. He said, you may well be right, said, but if that happens, uh, he said, there is another code in Afghanistan, which he said, every Pashtun has to at least pretend to respect and obey, and that is the Sharia. And he said, if we see a breakdown, you know, of, of basic order in Afghanistan, we will restore order on the basis of the Sharia. And that is pretty much exactly what the Taliban did uh, from the, the mid 1990s on. Uh, they recreated a form of Afghan state based on uh, their own <coughs> version of the Sharia, uh, but which was basically the, you know, the traditional rural, uh, um, but, but also very heavily Quranic. They, they were absolutely determined um, that this should be the strictest Quranic um, code uh, possible. Now, this um, really tied in perfectly, uh, both with aspects of Ibn Khaldun, but especially with the work of Ibn Khaldun's greatest modern uh, exegesis or, or analyst or disciple, you could say, uh, Ernest Gellner, um, who writes about this in a, a famous essay, Flux and Reflux in the, the Affairs of, of Men. I, I, I still have the copy. I took with me also into Afghanistan, sort of splashed with, with soup and extremely muddy. I rather treasure it. Um, because on the one hand, uh, Western propaganda tr tried to make a, a, an enormous thing that this Taliban code was hostile to and different from the traditional Pashtun Valley, the tribal traditions in many ways, and therefore was alien. To Afghanistan. Well, that was right and it was wrong. It was in certain ways uh, alien to the tribal tradition, but this attempt to reform the tribal tradition through strict Quranic Islam is also something that goes a long way back in Afghanistan, at least the 1830s, possibly far beyond that. Uh, now, an interesting twist to this as well is that in these areas of Afghanistan, the Sharia today is to some extent playing, vis-a-vis the, -vis the Pashtun Valley, the role that it played in Arabia in the seventh century when Islam and the Sharia first originated. It is a way of imposing discipline and basic civilized order on what to be completely politically incorrect are often extremely barbarous local traditions, especially as far as women are concerned. And one of the most striking things I came across um, on the, the occasions when I was able to talk to um, uh, women, including uh, educated women in uh, the Pashtun areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan, was that the women overwhelmingly preferred the Sharia to the Pashtun Valley. Uh, because the, uh, th there is more basic law, there are greater protections, um, there are much higher standards of evidence, um, and uh, <coughs> the punishments are not so barbarous. I mean, they are harsh, but they're not that bad as under the Pashtun Valley. Uh, so the, and uh, if you track, if you read um, Sana Harun's book, for example, this attempt by Quranic reformers to reform tribal tradition. Uh, for example, abolishing a truly hideous aspect of the Pashtun Valley, um, Swaraj, which is the, the um, giving of, of um, infant girls in marriage uh, as part of the settlement of tribal feuds. The Taliban really made a determined effort to stamp that out. Um, so this, this tradition goes back a long way in, in, in Afghanistan. And was given a tremendous boost in the mid 1990s by this very widespread sense in Afghan society of moral disgrace. 
in understanding the rise of the Taliban in the 1990s, you have to understand not just the, the, the chaos and the dreadful you know, oppression by Mujahideen warlords and the terrible civil war which had destroyed Kabul. You also have to understand the degree of religious idealism that Afghans had invested in the Afghan Jihad against the Soviets and communists in, in the 1980s. And the degree to which they felt ashamed shamed by the dreadful state into which Afghanistan had fallen by the mid-90s, and the degree to which these Mujahideen commanders to whom they had looked up had turned out to be monstrously corrupt and oppressive, and so on. So the Taliban really rose on the strength of this. Now, so much for the rise of the Taliban in the, um, in the 1980s. Um, fairly briefly, because of course I've talked too much, as usual. Um, uh, the return of the Taliban after the American conquest uh, in 2001. And um, here you can see uh, real parallels on, you know, on both sides, I think, with the Soviet experience. Years and years ago, when he was commander of the 14th Army in um, Moldova, in Pridnestrovia, I interviewed General Alexander Lebed. Uh, and um, of course, I was asking him about, about what was going on there. Um, but then chatting, he discovered that I'd been a journalist with the Dushmani. He, of course, was a Soviet officer on the other side. And he was, um, so we had a, a conversation about this. And I, I asked him, um, General, there's something I don't understand. Um, how can the Soviet Union have gone into Afghanistan, you know, not seemingly having studied what happened to the British in Afghanistan, which was not, of course, very nice. And he gave a very bitter, ironic laugh. And he said, oh, but you don't understand. For us, you British were imperialist capitalist oppressors of the Afghans. We were bringing liberation and progress to the working people of Afghanistan, he said. You know, of course, he he meant it as a well as a criticism of the Soviet system. Now, the tragicomic thing is that I had responses which changed just one word, uh, and I got exactly the same responses from Americans after two thousand and one. Look, don't you think you ought to study the Soviet and the the, the British experience in Afghanistan? No. Oh, well, what, what does that have to teach us? We're we're bringing freedom and democracy. To, to, to ordinary Afghans, they're going to. Well, why, you know, why, why should they see us as oppressors? Well, uh, two things there. One general, one specific. Um, what every invader of Afghanistan, and by the way, some you know leaders of Afghan states themselves did not realize, is that the early stages of modern state building, not just in Afghanistan, but in most places actually, I think. Are, tend to be very, very nasty because the state is poor, uh, but it needs to fight. Um, it cannot provide services. It can't pay for them. And anyway, it doesn't think of, of these things. So basically, the face that the state presents to ordinary people uh, is a very un pleasant one, very predatory. And when it's not the work of the state itself, it is the work of the local agents of the state, you know, who exist basically to, ta uh, to tax you, but then to steal the taxes for themselves, uh, to make sure that it's your son who's conscripted into the army and not their son, uh, to use their power to punish anyone with whom they have a local feud or disagreement, and of course, worst of all, uh, to rape your daughter or sister. You know. So, um, but pe people just, you know, from state traditions have completely forgotten that the automatic instinct of peasants in this kind of society faced with the state or the police or the courts is to run away. And in the essay, I, I quote a famous passage from uh, the um, uh, memoir of uh, an Italian liberal from the north, exiled to southern Italy uh, under um, Mussolini, Christ stopped at Eboli, um, in which this guy um, tries to explain to his northern Italian friends when he's 
allowed to go back there, just why it is that Southern Italian peasants hate the state so much. Because his Northern Italian friends see the state as the solution to everything. You know, if you've got a problem in the South, increase state power. No, said Carlo Levi, state power down there is deeply corrupt, deeply oppressive. The, the, the ordinary peasants flee from it and have good reason to flee from it. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> now, there is a more specific thing which goes back to justice and the Pashtun Valley. In the, the Pashtun rural areas, people have wanted an element of state power uh, for many of the same reasons that uh, in the past, less so today, they would appeal to Sayyids, to people of um, local Islamic uh, uh, figures claiming descent from the Prophet, to mediate in tribal disputes, because Sayyids, of course, do not belong to any of the Afghan tribes, so they are, in principle, neutral. Sayyids, however, also have no armed force behind them, whereas the state in the last resort can also enforce its will. Um, there's a, a, another absolutely brilliant book about uh, Afghanistan, but northern Afghanistan, about the game of Buskashi by Whitney Azoy, which I strongly recommend from this point of view, the role of the state in mediating local disputes. Um, but they want to bring their problems to the state. You know, they want to bring their disputes to the state to be solved. They do not want the state to come to them because it's never brought them anything. Now, the American and Afghan state uh, effort after 2001 failed on, on both counts. It could not win new confidence of the people because through, of course, the civil war, but also the unbelievable chaos of the Afghan government, the corruption, but also the totally dysfunctional nature of the Western aid effort, um, in the vast majority of the country, it wasn't actually bringing clinics or schools or anything else to the local peoples. They saw nothing out of the state. On the other hand, if the fundamental role of the state in these societies is to mediate local disputes, the last thing, the very, very, very last thing you want is democracy. Um, because... Uh, as um, it was described to me, one um, you know, Afghan public debate in the early uh, days after, after 2001, where people actually stood up and argued with each other in public. And the man talking to me said, the killings began on the way home because people had you know, uh, clashed, argued with each other, insulted each other in, in public. But also, of course, democracy means winners and losers and a state which is going to belong to the winner. You have got to have a neutral state, neutral, but with force to impose its will. Um, because the idea of a, an independent legal system separate from the state is simply not going to work in Afghanistan and is certainly not believed in by any Afghan. Um, I mean, quite apart from the corruption of the state. So the, the Taliban restored its authority in the Afghan countryside very much on the basis of the Sharia, a legal code which everybody understood in principle and which was quick in its results, relatively uncorrupt and with tremendous cultural legitimacy. So, um, yeah, that's uh, more or less the, uh, the end of my uh, talk. Just one last thing though, to circle back to uh, close to the beginning. Um, the Taliban today in Afghanistan have a pretty good basis, at least among the Pashtuns, for their own version of state building. But that's say morally, institutionally speaking, they lack the same thing that every previous Afghan state has lacked, which is money, revenue. And the solution of pretty much every Afghan state since um, Emir Abdul Rahman took British subsidies in the 1880s has been to rely on external 
subsidies for state revenue. Uh, now, of course, most the, the great majority of those have now gone with the American withdrawal. Uh, the question is basically whether anyone else will come up with the subsidies that the Taliban need in order to run the Afghan state. Uh, now, here, the Taliban really have only three assets. And the contradictory thing is, is that in two cases, if they actually do what external powers want, uh, they will remove the incentive of external powers to subsidize them. One, of course, is the threat of terrorism from ISIS. Um, the Taliban have promised uh, China and Russia to suppress ISIS, promised others as well. But if they succeed in um, suppressing ISIS, well, why should China and Russia give Afghanistan money? Secondly, is the heroin trade, um, from which they are still extracting revenue. They promised to suppress the heroin trade, they want money to do so. Uh, but of course, if they do suppress the heroin trade, will people go on giving them the money? Um, and the third thing is, of course, geo uh, well, geopolitical importance, but that now seems actually rather slight. And copper, if you can get the Chinese to invest in the, in the copper mines. Uh, but then there's a lot of copper elsewhere in the world, and getting it out of Afghanistan is going to be a major effort. The Chinese have signed a contract in principle Will they go through with it? They don't seem to be in, in any fast hurry to do so for very understandable reasons. Uh, in other words, um, Afghanistan may simply be no longer important enough uh, for external players to subsidize the Afghan state. On the other hand, if they fail to subsidize the Afghan state, uh, then the Afghan state may collapse again, and then we will be back, as you might say, to square one. That is my rather gloomy take on, um, uh, on modern Afghan history. Um, and to sum it up in a, an, an epigram of my own, uh, Afghan history would tend to suggest that the only thing worse than having a state is not having a state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anatole. This has been absolutely fascinating. Um, you must have conducted hundreds of interviews. How many interviews? during all of your time well you can okay. uh, uh, over over Is 30 it? over 34 years although there was a pause in the middle while i was in in in, uh, in the former soviet union for seven years you can talk to a lot of people over <laughs> over Gosh. 34 years yeah absolutely incredible um yeah so we have um discussed some scenarios um of how or rather anatole has suggested some of the potential scenarios um, of the of how things are going to unfold in Afghanistan, which we'll all observe um, keenly. Um, now, if anyone um, has any questions, please feel free to um, ask them either in the chat or you can even raise your hand. We have about 40 participants today, so I'm sure it'll be um, a cozy audience. So. Not too crowded. Um, but quite a few participants, though, because there's a lot of interest in Afghanistan. But as I said, some of our students wanted to come, but they had classes. Um, now, yeah, so we have the first question from Ser Sergei Andreev. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask it yourself, um, please? Just a second. Yeah. Thanks, Alexandra. Okay. This should work. Or I could read it out, I suppose. I, I can yeah. see. It. I think he's, um, he's ready yeah. to. Yes, uh, I managed to unmute myself. How's the video? How is the proverbial video? Uh, well, uh, so my technical incompetence, I am not in a position to, to show my, my face to the distinguished audience. So, uh, Dr. Levin, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, if we distinguish traditionalist and demodernizing policies historically developing in Afghanistan by various actors, starting from, well, say, Bachai, Sakao, Shot, Lift, Emirate, uh, which basically reminds us of some of the Taliban policies, though without the Pashtun nationalist twist. Um, so if we distinguish the two, do you think they both fit into the uh, Ibn Khaldun's paradigm, or there is any difference between the two in Ibn Khaldun's terms? Well, Ibn Khaldun, of course, did not think in terms of a modernizing state. That 
you know, that, that, that concept naturally in the 14th century was completely uh, alien to him. So the reaction against westernized modernization as such, you know, that is a new element. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a very traditional element uh, which has taken uh, a new form since the onset of Western colonialism or neo-colonialism under the Americans. And that is, of course, that you know, Ibn Khaldun makes a tremendous play, you know, as, as have all the uh, both tribal and Islamist uh, revolts, uh, with the, uh, the, the corruption and decadence of the cities and the rulers. You know, this is his essential you know, paradigm, obviously, that the, the rulers of the cities become corrupt, lazy, decadent. Uh, now, of course, since the onset of Western colonialism, you have this whole narrative against the modern state elites, but with one adjective added. Uh, oh, by the way, I mean, of course, the, traditionally also corrupt and therefore un-Islamic. Uh, no, I mean, of course, calling themselves Muslim, but betraying, you know, core Islamic uh, features. But now you, you can add the, um, the adjective westernized uh, or Europeanized or some version of that. In, in other words, the, the, the rulers of the state are, are not just corrupt and decadent and un-Islamic in that sense. They are also acting as puppets of infidel European rulers and spreaders of infidel European ideas. So this, you know, as far as every, you know, uh, revolt in the name of Islam since the 19th century uh, has had it, and certainly, of course, the revolt of Bachi Sarkar against Amanullah, um, this is the additional element, the colonial anti-colonial or, you know, Western infidel um, uh, and opposition to that, uh, which, of course, was not a uh, was not a fact that was not as such was not a factor in Haldun's day. Good, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm wondering if Alexander has any comment at all. We usually ask him as well, but be with us today. Alexander, you mean me? Uh, <laughs> yes, Professor Looking, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have an informal well, session I, here in, in, in uh, Russian. I'd call you, of course, Alexander Vladimirovich, but. Uh... OK, uh, so just call me your excellency. That's no problem. That's the Seattle street. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, you see, um, uh, well, uh, it looks that um, all world empires, you know, Britain, uh, the Russia, the Soviet Union, and uh, um, uh, and now the United States uh, have failed in Afghanistan. Uh, but we have uh, the last the big country, I think, which is China. What do you think about? If, well, sometimes I jokingly say to my Chinese friends that, I mean, by the way, you didn't say that, but. If you talk to military people in all these countries, they would always say, I don't know if Mr. Lebet told or General Lebet told you this, but, but uh, you know, like official people always say that the main problem was that they lacked the, the, the number of, uh, uh, of, the, of their forces, you know, because th there were not many people. I mean, the Soviets, how many of them were like 100,000 or something. Americans, I think there were more at the highest point. But still, they always, you know, said that it was not enough. I mean, China could send there like 1 million people, let's say. The Chinese, uh, Chinese army is like 3 million or more. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, they are not going to do that because they're not uh, so imperialist. But generally, what do you think China, what China, what role China can play there? Uh, now, when Americans are out. Well, you know, I think you, you put your finger on it. Of course, the, the, the Chinese could have um, f could flood the place with Chinese troops. Um, you know, even the Americans in principle uh, could have uh, raised um, uh, 
many, many more troops and put them in. But frankly, Afghanistan is just not worth it. You know, there's, 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 there's nothing there that would make that degree of, of effort and money and sacrifice worthwhile. I mean, all my, uh, you know, talks with Chinese officials have su suggest that they are going to be very, very cautious uh, about that. And, um, you know, uh, by the way, can you all hear me still? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, because, sorry, it went off. Um, and, um, you know, they, they may subsidise the Taliban, uh, you know, to the extent of maintaining basic control and fighting against ISIS, and of course, especially because ISIS is cl closely linked to China's Uyghur um, uh, rebels, who are, some of whom are in Afghanistan. Um, and depending on the international price of copper uh, and China's need for copper, and also perhaps China's, you know, worry about its seaborne imports of copper, perhaps they will at some stage go ahead to develop this great um, potential copper mine at Einak. But in terms of trying to really take over Afghanistan and change the running of the place, no. And I think, by the way, one uh, reason for that is that the, the Chinese... Uh, although they would never ever say so in public, have become pretty disillusioned by their experience of investing in uh, in Pakistan next door. Uh, you can hear some very bitter comments in private from the Chinese about their experience there, which I think has, um, has sort of rather put them off. I mean, on the other hand, I suppose, I mean, if the Chinese were really to try to turn Iran into an ally against America in the Middle East, there are certain signs of that, then perhaps they might feel the need to secure Afghanistan, you know, as a country at Iran's back. But I still don't think that they would put, you know, any, in any great effort into that. I mean, after all, uh, you know, pe people, you know, c countries are um, capable of learning to some extent from history. There was actually an Indian general uh, who, who said to me that, um, you know, although he said there are some very, you know, he had some rather ambitious and reckless figures among his Indian military colleagues, he said, you don't have to be a historical genius, uh, these were his words, uh, to understand that for outside powers to intervene in Afghanistan does not usually turn out well. Very true. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay, so um, Alexandra's question in the chat as well. I'd like to. Uh, yeah. Um, will you read it? Read it out loud. <laughs> it's me. Uh, uh, yeah. Feel free to. Thank you very much, Dr. Levin. Yeah, I loved your lecture. It's really, it's very interesting one. Uh, although I'm not an expert in Afghanistan, I wanted to ask. Um, whether the acknowledgement of the Taliban uh, of the Taliban by the international society uh, change uh, the international relations in such a way that non-state actors such as like terrorist groups and other non-state groups uh, will be acknowledged as um, full-scale actors uh, in international society. Thank you. Well, it reminds me a bit of, was it in Shakespeare or some 16th century writer um, wrote the lines, treason doth never prosper. What's the reason? For if it prosper, none dare call it treason. In other words, um, you know, if terrorist groups win power and then give up terrorism, as you might say, um, then people will, I think, cease to treat them as terrorist groups for, for the simple reason that um, they will be the effective state authority. And if people want to deal with that state, they will have no choice you know, but to do so. It is, of course, worth remembering that, um, uh, it, you know, I mean, obviously the Taliban are a, a, a somewhat extreme case, but, you know, um, across uh, the former European empires, in their declining years. It was very common actually for the British and the French, not sure about the Dutch, 
to describe their you know local nationalist um, uh, enemies or rebels as terrorists. And indeed, I mean, in the case of the FLN and some others, they actually were terrorists. They did, you know, ha have a terrorist strategy uh, in um, in Algeria. Uh, I mean, they had a guerrilla strategy, but also a, a terrorist strategy uh, in, in the 1950s. Uh, but, you know, you end up doing a deal with them, and then everybody has to sort of forget about the terrorism, as long, of course, as they don't keep on doing it. I mean, obviously, if the FLN had, you know, had then started, you know, in the 1960s, or continued terrorist attacks on mainland France, well, then the attitude of the international community to Algeria would have been very different. I mean, if the Taliban now does openly host terrorist groups that conduct attacks against Russia, China, America, wherever, then, um, then indeed they will, they will lose their international recognition again. But if they, you know, if they maintain a, a basically orderly government of Afghanistan, I think eventually people will just forget that they were terrorists, I suspect. And, and as I say, that's part, you know, not I think of, of, a, of a new pattern, but actually in a way of a very a very old one. I mean, the, the the other thing, of course, that not just colonial powers, but governments throughout the Muslim world uh, always accused their tribal enemies of being were bandits, uh, brigands. And what's more, they were right, as Ibn Khaldun would would have told you. You know, they were very much given to plunder and and robbery. Uh, but of course, once these plundering bandits became the government, well, they they became the government. Thank you. We have um, a very uh, relevant question from Nandan Unikrishna. Um, yeah. I'm just going to unmute you. Um, yeah, Nandan, would you like to ask it yourself? Hi, hi, yeah. Anatol. How are you? Hello. Hi. Uh, если ваша светлость, господин Лукин, мне позволит, uh, I would like to Anatol, ask Anatol a very simple question. It's there, of course. But basically, you have a very pessimistic view about Afghan society and its future, uh, which essentially condemns them to being in this eternal conflict between uh, Sharia and Pashtun Wali, you know, with a little bit of ethnicity of Tajiks and Uzbeks and all thrown in. So one is, will they be able to break out? What will be the catalyst? The second is a more... Uh, long-standing question which I'm coming out of Indian history. You know, there are some people or academics who maintain that one of the reasons that uh, India, which was 500 odd Maharajas, actually is a united country is because the British built, built railways. Mm -hmm. Would that be uh, relevant to Afghanistan, which has no railways? Yeah. Oh, I mean, very much so. And to be honest, I mean, one of the most, I mean, truly, actually, for me, humiliating things about the, the Western effort in Afghanistan is that, you know, 20 years and trillions of dollars spent, and we didn't manage to lay a single mile of railway, you know, in the country. Um, now, that's where the Chinese could really come in. But I, I think that they would only do that, you know, if they saw considerable profit for China yeah, yeah. out of it. Um, but yes, I mean, I think that that would gradually, you know, and to, a, to an extent, uh, transform the country. I mean, there is a, another open question, of course, which it's too, too, too early, much too early to answer, um, which is whether the Taliban itself can take on, you know, aspects of modern state building. Um, they, I mean, there, there are, of course, many things, you know, against that in terms of their, their attitudes, their culture. But there are a couple of um, uh, more positive things. Uh, the first is simply the fact that, uh, at least in the Pashtun areas, you know, they are the, the only force that has actually managed to exert real and legitimate authority over large parts of the country. That was demonstrated when they were, I mean, both by their extraordinary survival over the past 20 years, but also, you know, by the fact that when they were in power, uh, 
they did actually manage to, to, to stamp out the heroin trade um, in the hope of Western recognition or international recognition and, and aid. Uh, the other thing I, I learned uh, to my considerable surprise, actually, when visiting the um, World Health Organization was that when the, the Taliban were in power, they committed themselves or were convinced to commit themselves uh, to a polio eradication program, which was actually very successful. And they ordered their local commanders and they ordered local society to bring their children to be vaccinated against polio, and they did. So, I mean, that suggests that, you know, there, there are certain elements of modernity or, or, or rationality. Um, but on the other hand, of course, uh, this would also depend on the Taliban being able to, to retain uh, enough basically sort of modern cadres who can run the elements of a modern state, you know, um, educated, trained modern people. And of course, so much of the Taliban's cultural program goes against that. I also have to say that that, that the man who uh, might have done that, to, to judge by his previous record in the Taliban government uh, in the 1990s, was the previous Taliban leader, Mullah Mansour, who the Americans assassinated four years ago, which is a tremendous lesson, you know, in these wars, do not kill the leaders on the other side, you might need them one day. You know? But I'm not, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm, I would never say that any country is, is simply doomed you know, per perpetually to, to, to this kind of syndrome. Um, it's just that, well, you know, if one has seen by now, I mean, how many since the, the overthrow of Amanullah, you know, successful revolts against modernizing and westernizing Afghan states uh, over the past 20 years, it does suggest something of a pattern, right? <laughs> Okay, um, thank you, Anatole, and thank you everyone who participated. I think on this um, slightly more hopeful note, we're going to um, end this wonderful session. This is uh, very educational for all of us. I think we don't get speakers like that very often. So thank you so much. Um, it's amazing to hear how you've uh, visited all those places. I mean, I think we could listen to, to, you, to you talk <laughs> for another hour or so. Right? <laughs> Anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It'd be fantastic. Um, right, thank you everyone so much for participating and um, thank you very much um, to our distinguished speaker, to everyone who contributed and I look forward to seeing you um, during our next 30th session of the Eurasian Seminar, which will be announced shortly. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Have a great evening. Bye bye.